So just a little bit about my background. Uh, as Jim was saying, I'm a professor at Eastern Michigan University. I, I have had some experience as a strength and conditioning coach. I started as a GA at Long Beach State University. I was an assistant at Cal State Fullerton. Um, I actually even got into the business of health clubs. I was an operations director from, for LA Fitness when it first started with one or two clubs. Uh, I even bought my own small gym in a ski resort in Mammoth Lakes, California. I owned that for five or six years. And uh, then just decided that uh, I always wanted to become a teacher. Um, I wanted to work at a community college, so I went and earned my master's degree at the University of Nevada in sport biomechanics. I wanted to teach weight training and racquetball classes, uh, and I was encouraged by my advisor to go on and get my doctorate. Went to Michigan State University and got my doctorate in biomechanics. Um, my, my emphasis was in anterior cruciate ligament injury uh, and understanding interventions or how we can prevent that type of injury from occurring. And it kind of led me down this path towards skill acquisition, how it is that we as athletes acquire skill. And that ultimately led me down this path of long-term athletic development. So I have a broad number of experiences over the years, and that's what I hope to bring to you uh, today. So as a parent, and I've got two boys, two teenage boys, uh, in moving to Michigan, uh, I didn't grow up with the, around the sport of uh, lacrosse. Um, but both of my sons expressed interest in the sport of lacrosse. Uh, but as you will find, they played multiple sports uh, where they were younger. And as a result of their participation in lacrosse, I became involved as an administ administrator for our local youth recreational team. And that's what I do right now. And that's how I'm going to kind of come at this is as, a, as an administrator uh, rather than a, a coach and things of that nature. What is long-term athletic development? I think one of the things that we have to understand is that a concept that's been around for quite a, bit, uh, a long time. Um, if you think about uh, ancient um, civilizations, such as those you find among the Athenians and the Spartans, uh, they raised their youth, particularly the males, to become better combatants. And they use a variety of physical training and mental training tactics and able to do that. And so that's kind of where the origins of this idea of athlete development started. And of course, these models and these ideas eventually found their ways uh, where it became as a weapon for uh, political doctrine, the free world versus communism. If you can't compete with guns and rockets, you compete with political ideologies, and the best platform for that is the Olympic Games. So there was quite a bit of investment from the communist countries into understanding or better understanding youth and sport development. Thus, the concepts of general physical preparation and specific physical preparation. I don't know how many of you are familiar with those terms. Istvan Balye was a Hungarian who emigrated to Canada when the Berlin Wall came down. And he brought some of these concepts with him to the West. And he wrote this book in 2013 titled Long-Term Athletic Development. And the concepts are very much tied to those ideas of general physical preparation and specific physical preparation. But what we have to understand with this concept is that it is a cradle-to-grave concept. It's from birth until we pass, and you'll see this in a few minutes. Athletic development to the, it refers to the physical development of youth. That includes training, health, skill, and performance-related components of fitness. One thing about this ideology is, is it's not exclusive to those kids that show extreme athletic prowess. It is for everybody. So it's a concept or an idea that's there for everybody to be able to utilize. The reason I mentioned that long-term athletic development is a path towards physical literacy, one of the ideas that I embrace as a local youth sport coach educator is that I want to involve or engage as many kids as I possibly can in our youth programs. It's important. It's important for our culture to become physically literate. And when we think about the concept of physical literacy, it's the competence and the confidence to move throughout the lifespan. It's not just about sports. It's about physical activity. It's about movement. Because we're all going to evolve from being youth sport participants to adults to potential coaches as parents and maybe perhaps administrators, and participating in physical activity as we age. And this has important uh, consequences later on in life that you'll see in a little bit. So this definition, the motivation, confidence, and physical competence to be able to participate and maintain physical activity throughout the lifespan is what physical literacy is. And long-term athletic development enables us to have a framework to achieve that in our culture. So, this concept or this idea of long-term athletic development was embraced by the United States Olympic Committee. And we've created our own framework, our own model. And the USOC has shared this framework with each of the national governing bodies for many of the 
respective sports that are out there. There's obviously USA Hockey, USA Lacrosse, USA Football, USA Baseball, USA Basketball, Tennis, Swimming, Tennis, so on and so forth. Each of these national governing bodies has created their own athletic development model for their respective sports. One of the things you have to realize is that the United States Olympic Committee, our governing body that oversees sport development in the United States, does not have the power to mandate for any of these sports to create their own model. And so one of the things that's kind of disconcerting about athlete development in the United States is that everybody kind of has their own path, their own direction in which they're going with their particular sport. Um, now, and I'll address that in a few minutes here, but it's basically a, a pathway, as I said earlier, that enables our youth or our kids to be able to pursue physical activity and sport throughout the lifespan. And so the United States Olympic Committee has embraced this long-term athletic framework. And they also embrace the fact that we use this framework as a path towards a physically literate culture and society. You can see to the right here there are various stages, and I'll give you a little bit better picture of these stages right here in a few minutes. So, essentially, grades K through 4. What is important about this framework is that we emphasize the opportunity for kids to discover various types of movement experiences and opportunities, to learn how to participate in various types of play and games, whether it be structured play or free play. This is essential and this is important. The acquisition of fundamental motor skill is so important to each and everybody's movement skill and ability. It would be similar to writing a paragraph. You cannot construct a paragraph unless you can put together sentences. You can't put together sentences unless you construct words, and you can't construct words unless you know the alphabet. Fundamental movement skills are your alphabet. If you have not acquired fundamental movement skills, it is very difficult to perform complex sport maneuvers. And so that is why at these age groups, it is very important from K through four to make sure that we ensure that these kids have the opportunity to be exposed to these fundamental movement opportunities and to be able to exhibit them in structured and free play opportunities. It is the first and most vital step in the development of athletes. As a mature, now we can start to introduce games and very basic skills and very basic tactics. Obviously, kids mature, and they want to challenge themselves in many different types of environments. And so for grades four through six, essentially, and I'm using grades here, one of the things that you have to understand with long-term athletic development is that it's extremely variable because growth and maturation of the human is extremely variable. And that's particularly more evident as you get into the train and compete stages here. Grade six and eight, so this is where we start that transition from childhood into adolescence and from adolescence into adulthood. So there's, a, again, a lot of variability here. So there's going to be changes in body mass. There's going to be changes in the hormonal mechanisms that contribute to physical strength. There's going to be changes in the length of the limbs and the circumference. All of these physical changes are going to create changes in terms of how we move and how you're capable of controlling the body. That's why it's so vital at the younger ages to learn fundamental movement skills. Your nervous system, your central nervous system, which begins its refinement in these early stages, that's your software. Your nervous system is your operating software. Your muscles, your bones, your tendons, your ligaments, your connective tissue, that's your hardware. The software dictates what the hardware does. And so that's why it's so important at these early ages to really start to learn how to refine movements. As kids become high school students, it's very important that we give them multiple opportunities to learn how to move. And this is true in the earlier stages as well. But I like the idea of the multi-sport athlete because it exposes them to multiple movement experiences. Movement experiences that you will use in various types of practice and competitive types of situations. We also know and realize that every child is not going to be a high school athlete. It's understandable. But the most important thing is in the earlier stages here, where they've become competent and confident movers, that maybe perhaps there are other movement experiences that they appreciate and they enjoy, such as dance, or rock climbing, or surfing, or longboarding, or paddle tennis, or whatever. It doesn't matter. But you've given them that confidence and that confidence where that maybe perhaps they are not that varsity athlete, but they still 
find enjoyment and pleasure in participating in various types of games and play. And there are many opportunities for them to do that. Because we also know that not every high school athlete is going to be a college athlete, and not every college athlete is going to be a professional athlete. However, if we follow the framework, we have given them the tools that they need to pursue and follow physical activity throughout the lifespan. And that is the blessing of this long-term athletic development, is that it gives you a participation pathway and a competition pathway. As we reach our adult stages, this gives us opportunity to maybe, perhaps, if we're lucky, participate as a collegiate or professional or elite athlete. It gives us the opportunity to participate in many of those movement opportunities that I explained earlier. But also what's important is the opportunity to give back. Give back as a mentor. Give back as a coach. Give back as an administrator. That's where I'm right now. I participated in a sport as a young child in many sports. But at this stage of my life, I participate recreationally but I'm giving back as an administrator and as a coach so that we can give kids a model or a framework similar to this so that the cycle can perpetuate itself. This is an example of an athlete development model. And I, the reason I have this here is I want you to understand that there's both what we call vertical and horizontal integration. Through various stages of maturation, and if you can see this at the bottom, prepubertal, circumpubertal, and postpubertal, basically where you are in terms of this transition from childhood to adult. You can see that vertically, all of these motor abilities, speed, power, strength, fundamental motor ability, they're all important. And we don't neglect any one of these at any stage. They're all important. But there are certain things that we emphasize more at a certain stage than others. And so, we emphasize things more as we move horizontally on this table. For example, we know that strength and power, using your body weight in a play or game type of environment, is very important as a young kid. But as you mature, we know that unless testosterone or growth hormone or insulin-like growth factors are present and available, you're not going to exhibit exceptional strength. You're not going to be able to exhibit exceptional hypertrophy until the later stages where we have the opportunity to expose you to various types of resistance training programs and protocols. So it both has vertical integration in that we, we want to do everything, but we emphasize certain things depending upon where you are in the stages. So movement is of emphasis in the earlier stages. Power and strength are of more emphasis in the later stages when we have those hormonal mechanisms in place to be able to emphasize that. I speak to parents, and I can't speak like an academic to parents. They quite frankly don't have the same background. So what I like to do to get buy-in, and that's important for my league, I'm trying to get buy-in for my parents to kind of embrace and follow the framework that I would look to, like to have so that I can produce more participation. Participation is important to me. So if you look at this, if you look at my adaptation to the American development model, K through four, I emphasize discovery and exploration, fundamentals of movement, instruction of very basic lacrosse skills, play and fun. Play and fun is of emphasis. The number one reason kids participate in sport, it's fun. The number one reason they drop out, it's not fun. Fun is extremely vital for me. I have to make that experience positive. So that's a very strong emphasis for me to keep participation and have those kids go back and tell their friends, hey, you should try this lacrosse stuff out. It's a lot of fun. Have them come back. Fifth and eighth grade, again, depending upon where they are in terms of maturation, play and fun is always emphasized. I emphasize a multi-sport experience. I have situations where parents will come to me with a conflict. Should my son play baseball? And lacrosse, should my daughter do softball and lacrosse? I go, why don't you ask them? Let them pick. Let them choose what they want to play. And sometimes they'll say, well, they're confused. They want to do both. I say, awesome. They might miss some practices. They might, might miss some games. So what? Who cares? It's about the kid. Let them have fun. And the movement experiences, as you, as you will see, they cross. They can help each other. All sports can mutually help each other in the development of an athlete. So I don't get in the middle of that, particularly in these stages, fifth and eighth grade. 
improvement of athletic ability. So uh, my definition of an athlete is your ability to solve a movement problem. That's a very, very simplistic definition. Um, but in that process, there are many things as an athlete at, that you have to have. In this facility, um, well, I guess we can divide it into three areas. We can look at physical development, we can look at psychological development, and there's the nutritional perspectives. Uh, my expertise is only in the physical. I don't have much of a psychological or nutritional background. But I look at things from the physical, I look at biomotor abilities. I look at things like stamina, balance, mobility, strength, power, speed, coordination, agility, quickness, and dexterity. Those are 10 biomotor abilities. It's a facility like this one, which is an outstanding facility, by the way. It's a facility like this that emphasizes those biomotor abilities so they can do them to complement their athletic skills, their specific athletic skills, to become better athletes. So this is kind of where we begin to have kids try to appreciate that these biomotor abilities or these skills are very important for their continued athletic success. And so we start to introduce these things in fifth and eighth grade. And we start to be a little bit more complex in terms of specific tactics. As they transition into high school, now our preparation is not so general, it's really more specific. And it's this period of time from K through eight that we've really emphasized this general preparation. And we really want them to start to master the technical skills of lacrosse, the tactics of lacrosse, but also those specific things, metabolically and mechanically, that are going to be specific for their sport. And we're also going to give them opportunities for more advanced competition. Hopefully, it's through this process that we start with discovering exploration and fundamentals of movement that eventually we get to this pathway where they are a lifelong participant as a lacrosse player, as a lacrosse official, as a lacrosse administrator, as a lacrosse parent, or whatever other sports it is that they're involved with. It doesn't matter to me. The important thing is that they're a lifelong participant, and again, we're on that pathway toward becoming a physically literate individual. So as I said earlier, and I'll just basically show you a few concepts from this model. Uh, as I said earlier, fundamental movement skills and motor skills, those are very, very essential. Um, I just have this, um, I don't, you know, uh, being a bi I'm, by trade, I'm a biomechanist. That's my background. That's, that's first and foremost my background is in, is in sport biomechanics and understanding how it is that we acquire skill. And uh, one of the most basic things is this, when you look at a pyramid here, is that uh, coordinative movements or abilities are the first thing you want to learn. You know, hop, skip, leap, jump, throw, catch, roll, tumble, the basic, very basic fundamental motor skills. And then in this process of training, uh, teach them how to change direction. And that's agility, just your ability to change direction. Uh, your ability to change direction quickly is what we call quickness. Um, but we don't stop there in our training because sport, sport occurs in very unpredictable circumstances. Um, unfortunately, it's not choreographed. And so we have to expose them the training scenarios or situations that are very unpredictable and very challenging for them to be able to figure out. And that's testing the nervous system, quite frankly. Um, I always find it funny when I'm watching a game, whether it be a basketball game or a football game, and you see an athlete leap over a defender just as you see it here, and the announcer goes, you can't teach this. Um, that's not true. Uh, this athlete is coming up with a movement solution to the movement problem. The solution to that problem evolved from the training that came well before this situation arised. But I just kind of want to show you this and emphasize that the mastery of fundamental movement skills in the earlier stages is extremely vital to learning more complex movements that you're going to see in sport. Another thing that's important for youth and athletic development is the opportunity to participate in small-sided games. It was about a year ago. I was in a uh, a dome complex in suburban Detroit, and I was watching a U10 soccer game on a regulation soccer pitch. That is a major league soccer, regulation soccer pitch. And I was watching the game for about five to six minutes or so, and the entire game occurred in one far corner of this uh, dome. Uh, the, the, the goalie, literally, was uh, on this side where the, uh, from where the play was, was leaning against his goal, like a kid playing right field, picking dandelions, whatever because he never saw any action for about eight or nine, ten minutes. The defenders were talking back and forth with the goalie. So in this competitive scenario, situation, only a percentage of the kids were really getting an opportunity to understand uh, the scope and nature of the sport. Um, so 
what we have to do is we have to find opportunities where we have to bring the game to the kids. And one of the ways that we can do this is to create small-sided environments. Small-sided environments for many games means you're going to get more touches, more opportunities to um, make improvements, and more opportunities to make mistakes. You have to make mistakes. You don't learn unless you make mistakes. Small-sided gives you the opportunity to be engaged more to make those mistakes so that you can make those refinements. And so that is particularly important at a young age. We can also modify equipment, the field, dimensions, age group. There's a number of things um, that we can do to kind of alter that. Uh, rules and regulations can be modified, but when you're looking at what we're doing in those earlier stages, from train to compete and below, modifying things and creating small-sided scenarios really challenges your nervous system to come up with multiple solutions to the multiple problems it is you're going to encounter. And that's the first step in athletic development.